Hi everyone, this is Jeff Wall from the library and we're going to talk today about peer-reviewed or scholarly articles. You may have signed up for a class and one of your first assignments tells you that you can only use research from peer-reviewed or scholarly articles. Or more commonly, it's asking for at least five sources from peer-reviewed or scholarly journals. And the first question, if you haven't seen these before, is what, what is a peer-reviewed scholarly article? What are we even talking about here? It can be really confusing if you haven't looked at these types of sources before. So we're going to cover today just the basics of what, what are these things? What are these, what are these peer-reviewed scholarly articles? Okay, so peer-reviewed journals versus popular magazines. You're probably very familiar with popular magazines or news websites or general websites that you go to look at. And peer-reviewed articles, however, are published in specialized academic professional journals. You will, very rarely will you find these journals on any kind of a newsstand or in a Barnes & Noble or even through Amazon.com. They're very specialized, published for, for a special audience. A peer-reviewed journal's intended audience is a professional community related to a field of study. It's assumed that the reader is very educated on the topic. So these articles start with the assumption that you are very, very familiar and very educated on this topic. While a popular magazine's intended audience is pretty much everybody with any level of education or no education on a particular topic. So popular magazines or news websites or general websites, they summarize everything so that just about anyone could understand it. That's one of the biggest differences. The peer-reviewed journal, that audience, there's a lot of big words, a lot of jargon from that field of study, and they assume that you have a master's degree or a PhD and that you're a high-level professional in that field. Let's look at a few examples of these. So here's an example of an article from a general interest popular news publication. So, not exercising may be worse for your health than smoking, study says. This is from Time, and uh, this is Time.com. And you can see there's ads all over the website. And the, the title of the article very much suggests, I mean, do you ever wonder, you see all these things that say new study says or study proves. Where do you think that information comes from? Let's look this over. There's the author. It's just a very, not a very long article that makes it very very clear to anyone reading this what this study says. It does have a link to the actual study because this article, the person who wrote this article did not generate the data for this. This person is summarizing the data in a much more complex peer-reviewed article that there's a link to right there. New findings published in the journal. So they're telling you, I didn't come up with this data, but they're interpreting this data. They're boiling it down into a very simple, easy to read narrative. It's not even a full page. And that's fine. And it gives you, but this is someone else's interpretation of the data, trying to make it so anyone could understand it. So let's go back to our presentation. Now that's an example of just a general interest, popular news publication. Here's another example here. So this is another general interest, CNN Health, summarizing this same study. But this is not the peer-reviewed study. Not exercising worse for your health than smoking, diabetes, and heart disease, study reveals. Study re Again, all the time you'll see in these general interest publications saying new study proves, new study shows. But most of us aren't going to go find the actual study. If we just look at this summary, someone else has read this study and is summarizing what the basic findings of are to an audience reading this who, who is not very educated in the medical field. They might be, but it's written with, with the understanding that you really aren't that educated in this area. So they make it very easy to understand. But they also, you don't really see how these conclusions were reached. You just see kind of a, someone else's interpretation and summary, which is fine, which is fine for the general general reading public. Now, let's look at the actual peer-reviewed article that these articles are summarizing. Let's go to the actual source. So, 
and I'm going to close out some of these because one of those is playing. So um, here is the actual article. Let's go to the PDF for this article. So this is the actual study that was done. Notice the title is not the same. It's not the same at all. Um, you really have to read this to understand. And let's just take a look at it. There's Generally, these types of articles follow very similar formats. There's an abstract, kind of a summary of everything they talked about. Then you get into an introduction telling you why they did this research. But you can see it's a lot more complicated article than this time piece. And this is, again, this is great, but if you're studying, if you're studying a field at a deeper level, if you're in higher education, you're studying it, it's probably time that you start looking at the sources where this came from. This here, this is called a secondary source. This is summarizing the data, but this isn't the person who actually gathered the data. This is called a primary source. This is the peer-reviewed article that these others are summarizing for you and interpreting for you. And with this, they list their methods here. They tell you how they reach these conclusions. And it's very useful to look at this. Maybe there was a problem with these methods. A lot of times people read these types of articles and they say, oh, it's proven. It's proven. Well, this person says it's proven. But looking at this, you would want to look at this yourself and see why, why was this conclusion reached. And sometimes there's a problem with the study. Look at it, uh, all sorts of methods. They give you all these statistics. Then we get down to the results. This is what the results were from the data they gathered. Again, look how different this looks than, than this here. They just give you, just boiled down very simple, less than a page. Look how many pages this thing is. This is 12 pages. And when you get to the results, there's all these tables showing all this data that's gathered. This is telling you, this is showing you the actual data. This is the actual results of this original data that was gathered. It's not, it is kind of summarizing it, but look at all this language, look at all this jargon. It's assumed you kind of know what you're talking about. And it's kind of like being full immersion into another language. At first, it's going to be completely confusing. After you read these for a while, they, they do start to make sense. Here's a discussion. What, is, what does the data mean? What do these results mean? That's what the, the discussion is. And then usually, not always, but a lot of times there will be a conclusion section. And this isn't always there. And sometimes it's not labeled conclusion. Sometimes it'll just be in there somewhere. Um, but uh, then at the end, you'll notice, look at all these references. These are all the other sources. These are mostly going to be other peer-reviewed articles that the people who did this study referenced and read to learn. And notice how they're not all exactly about what this article's about. They're about all kinds of different things. That's a big mistake I see people making when they try to do peer-reviewed research, is they only look for one kind of article on one exact subject. But if you look at this, look at all these sources. And they're not all on exactly what this article's about, but they're on different aspects that could be related to it. Okay, so there's kind of an example to show you the differences. Let's go back to the show now. Here's another example of a peer-reviewed article. Let's look at another one. That last one I found in an open access database that was just online. This one I'm bringing up on a different subject. This one comes from our discovery service. These are our library databases here. Different subject, to beer or not to beer. A meta-analysis of the effects of beer consumption on cardiovascular health. Could be related, could be something that we, we would consult for this. And this is in this database, it's breaking some of this down up front. It's giving us the abstract right there, which is the summary of the article. Let's go to the full article. And I think this is really useful to start looking at. With these articles, I'm gonna make this bigger so we can see this more clearly. Again, you'll see a very similar format. There's the abstract right up front. Just like this one, let's take this one up to the top. Let's, let's kind of compare these a little bit. Different articles and different subjects, but they start off with this abstract. Then in this one, we get the introduction. They're telling us why, is, why should we be doing this research at all? Why is this research necessary? Let's look at this article, the one we looked at first. Introduction. They're talking about 
why is this study needed? There's been other studies, but they haven't covered exactly what we're talking about. Let's go to this one. Scroll down a little bit. Materials and methods. They're going to tell us how they gather data. Let's look at the other one. Methods. How did we gather this data? Study design and patient population. So the nice thing is they follow generally very, very similar formats. Let's keep looking. They're telling us all about the results. What did, what did the data show? When, what, what kind of data did we get? And the results, let's go back to our other one we looked at first. And there's all the sorts of different things in the methods. Then you get to results. What did we, what did we find there? And usually in the results section, you'll see a lot of this. You'll see a lot of tables because they're reporting to you exactly what they found. This is exactly the data. They're not really interpreting it yet, but they're showing you what the data is. In this one here, the first one we looked at in the results section, look at that. Tables showing you raw data that they collected. Let's go here. After all this data, lots of data showing you everything they gathered. They're just showing you the raw data, a whole bunch of it in this one. Discussion. That's very common. Then we get a discussion section where they're going to try to tell you what they think that this means. What did the data, what is the data that they found? What does it mean? Let's look at our first article here. After we get through all the data, all the tables, discussion. Again, same thing. What does this data mean? There's all this raw data up here. The discussion section, they're going to talk about what this means. Okay, let's look at this here. Discussion. What does it mean? Now this one, there it's not label conclusion, but you notice the last paragraph, the discussion. In conclusion, this is the first comprehensive meta-analysis. The conclusion kind of tells you what does this mean at and a larger scale. What does this mean for the rest of the world? Okay, so there's a kind of a quick intro to uh, what these do. Okay, why is my instructor requiring peer-reviewed research for my paper? I don't like this. I don't understand it. How come I can't just Google things or take things from Time or Wikipedia? Why do I have to do this? Okay, peer-reviewed journals are what professionals in your field read and refer to you will be expected to as well. You're now studying this subject at a higher level. You have now left the general population of people who don't know that much about these subjects. You're studying it in higher education. You are on the path to knowing a lot about this. These are what other people who are on your path are reading, and they're going to expect you, as you go further into this profession, they're going to expect you to be familiar with this literature as well. Your instructor is bringing you into the professional community of your field of study. By your instructor requiring you to look at peer-reviewed research, I know it's a pain. What's really happening is you're being welcomed into this community. And that's the way that it is. And it, it will take a while, but you will appreciate it eventually and you will be able to converse with other people. You'll really appreciate it in job interviews because often people will ask, what studies have you read? What journals do you read on this? And It'll sound a lot better if you're familiar with peer-reviewed literature than to just say, well, I just, I just read Wikipedia or I just, I just read Google News. And that doesn't, doesn't really make you look too serious. Okay. If you've entered an advanced field of study in a certain subject, the peer-reviewed requirement isn't going away. <laughs> Basically, get used to it. You may not like it. <clears throat> you're going to have to do it if, if you're going to study this at any advanced level. It's, there is no... If you transferred from one school to another thinking you're going to get away from it, you won't. I'll tell you a little story here. <clears throat> it's time for the training wheels to come off. When I was a kid, I rode my bike with training wheels and I loved it. I loved riding my bike and eventually my parents told me, you know, we're going to have to take those training wheels off. It's time that you learn to ride a bike for real. And I did not like that idea at all. I didn't understand how a bike could stand up just on two wheels. It didn't make any sense to me, and I didn't want to do it. I was happy riding my bike with training wheels. It, it went as fast as I needed it to go, had no problems, and my parents kept explaining, look, the other kids are riding bikes now without the training wheels. You're not going to be able to keep up with them. You're not going to be able to be taken seriously by them. You're going to have to take those training wheels off. 
I resisted it for as long as I possibly could. I was pretty old when those training wheels finally came off. But when they finally came off, yeah, I fell down and scraped myself up a bit at first. But eventually I understood there, I would not have been happy riding that little bike with the training wheels on for for any longer. And I needed, it was time to, it was time for the training wheels to come off. It's the same with this. You, you're now in a community of people who are very educated on, on your subject. It's time for the training wheels to come off and to start riding the big bikes with the big kids. Sorry. But I know a lot of people in my industry and they don't ever read peer reviewed journals. I hear this a lot. You know, that might might be true depending on what what you're talking about, but I will tell you any standard academic program you enter is going to require you to read peer reviewed literature. I would and if you find one that doesn't, I would be a little suspect of it. If you're going to be paying money to be getting a credential and to be raised to a higher level of understanding than the general public, and they're just having you read what the general public reads. I would be a little suspicious of that. Okay. If there is an industry you can be successful in just by work experience and knowledge, that's great. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you're going to have a hard time finding one of those in higher education, especially if you're at a master's level or if you're about halfway through your undergraduate. It's going to be pretty hard to find anything that doesn't require that. But long story short, if you're in higher education, this is a reality that won't go away. And if there's an industry you can be successful in without doing this kind of stuff, and maybe that's better for you. And there are other educational routes, but most higher education programs are going to require you to do this. So I just kind of said that <laughs> basically, whether you like it or not, it's not going to go away. It's, it's something, and I, you know, I didn't like it either when I was younger. Again, I was the kid who resisted taking the training wheels off as long as I could. I, <clears throat> but it didn't go away and I had to get used to it. And I sure am glad I learned how to read this type of literature. I would, it would be very hard for me in my, in my career if I didn't understand this. Okay, let's talk about how is theoretical academic knowledge generated? Let's talk about how knowledge is, is generated in our society. Universities and other research institutions conduct studies and carefully document the results. That's Universities don't just teach classes. A lot of institutions, universities are research institutions, and they a lot of what they do is conduct studies to try to learn new things. They conduct experiments to try to understand things better. This information is published in peer-reviewed journals that professionals in your field of study read. Then that information is disseminated out to the professional community and the academic community in your field of study through these specialized journals. The general public needs this information too, but they're not going to understand the peer-reviewed journals. Most most people aren't. It's, it's not written with the understanding. It's being written for a general person. So my third point, since most people won't understand these peer-reviewed articles, the results are interpreted and greatly simplified in popular publications such as Time, Psychology Today, news websites, or newspapers. That's how, so we start here. This information is generated in universities or research institutions. That information is published in peer-reviewed journals that a select group of people read and understand. And then if it's important enough or, or if people, the general people would be interested enough, you'll see those articles that say, a new study has proven, a new study shows, new results from Cambridge University show, and those are published in these general, and it's great, there's no problem with that. That is great that the average person I am not a medical doctor myself, but I'm very interested in learning about health. But <clears throat> a lot of the peer-reviewed medical journals I simply wouldn't understand. I think it's great that Time or Psychology Today or a news website or a newspaper boils this down so anyone can understand that. That's great. But you're now in this community. If, you've, if, you've, if you have a major and you're studying something, whether you like it or not, you're now in this group of people who who read these types of journals and you you need to join that community this way okay as someone who's earning a degree in a specialized field of study you want to put yourself in the group of pe people reading the original research in your field you want to be in that group of people you you don't want to be on the outside of it if you're earning a degree in a subject you have now or you soon will have a lot higher level of understanding on this subject than the average reader 
it's not going to take very long before those basic articles in the newspaper are going to kind of bore you and you're going to know more than the person writing that article probably you don't want to stay on the outside of your of your professional community you don't want to be there always being dependent on popular publications to interpret and summarize what other professions in your field will you want to be in the group of people who understand the original research you don't want to always be dependent on on someone who probably knows less than you about the topic summarizing it for you you don't you don't want to stay in that group okay how do I make sense of a peer-reviewed article? Great, I get it, I have to read these, but frankly, I don't understand them. How do they work? We talked about this a little bit earlier. Let's talk about it a little bit more. And they generally follow a similar format divided into sections. And it really helps to understand this. It really helped me to understand this. And when I read articles now, knowing that there's generally a predictable flow to these articles and sections I can count on, it really helps me to understand them and be less intimidated by them. They're usually going to start with an abstract. This is a summary of the article. Sometimes the abstract is just a paragraph. Sometimes it's two paragraphs. Usually it's just one paragraph. Or sometimes we'll see a very detailed abstract that will summarize all of the sections of the article very clearly in the abstract. So it's about half and half. Some of them have very detailed abstracts. Some of them have just a paragraph definitely start by reading the abstract. Read that abstract, read it a few times. Before you dive in to the, the more complex areas of this article, read the abstract and really understand that abstract. The introduction. What do we already know about this topic? Why are the authors doing this research? The authors are going to introduce their study and just tell you what else has been done on this topic. What did we study before doing this research? Why did we decide we needed to do this research in the first place? What's lacking in the peer-reviewed literature that's out there? What's lacking in the knowledge base about this topic? Why did we need to do this? That's very helpful to read that after you've read the abstract. Okay, the methods. What methods were used to gather and analyze this data? How did, who did we interview? Who did we survey? What kind of blood samples did we take? Where did the people or the animals live that we studied? What had the people been eating? What were the ages of? This tells you how they gathered the data. And this is really important. This is opening up the hood of the car and looking beneath it. What's making this thing run? And the results, with the methods, they just tell you how they gathered the data. The results will tell you what the data, what was the data. Usually you'll find a lot of tables here, a lot of raw data, a lot of raw data here, kind of confusing to look at. The discussion, they'll tell you what do the results mean. What does this data that we collected, what does it mean? What do we think it means? Is further study needed? Did we not answer our question? Should other studies be done on this? Or is this kind of a dead end? And the conclusion, what do the results mean on a larger scale? What, when we are telling you what the results mean in the discussion, what does this mean to the average person? What does this mean to the medical community in general? What does this mean to the psychology? professional community? What does this mean for program management at a larger scale? How is this going to affect the economy? How is this going to affect your society? So definitely when I'm looking at these articles, I would read the abstract always first. Read the abstract, of course, after you've read the title. Look at the title too, that'll help. Read the abstract. I would read the introduction. Then I usually skip over the methods and results. I'm going to come back to those. But the methods, it gets a little confusing. I'm going to come back to that. The data collected, I usually will go straight from here to the discussion to see what this article means and then what it means in a larger context. Okay, I want to see the car running before I look under the hood. I want to make sure it runs. I want to make sure this makes sense to me. I read this, this, then I read these, then I go back after this makes sense to me. Because this isn't going to make sense and the results aren't going to make any sense if you don't know what it really means. Now, that's not the way necessarily it should always be done, but I see a lot of people getting very confused, getting bogged down in the methods and the results section, especially here, reading through all those tables of data. If we're not really sure what we're talking about, this is really going to confuse you. However, it's really useful to go back and look at the methods. How did they reach these conclusions? Maybe you'll find a flaw in these methods that you think, hmm, that doesn't seem right to me. And that happens. 
And that's one reason why the methods are listed, so that people can very carefully look at those methods to see if this was scientifically sound. And the data collected, then go back and try to understand that. So it can be helpful to read those a little bit out of order. So let's look at some examples. Again, generally we're going to find abstract, introduction, methods, results, discussion, and a conclusion. Now the conclusion could be labeled formally like that, or the conclusion could just be in the text of the discussion, usually the last paragraph. Okay, let's look at some articles here. I'm looking up some articles on music and its effect on depression. Let's take a look here. We covered some of this earlier. This one, again, this is coming from our, <clears throat> our EBSCO Discovery Service. So here's this article. There's the abstract right there, and these detailed records from databases can help you a lot with these two. I'm going to go to the PDF to look at the full, the full article here. And I'm going to make this bigger so we can see this more clearly. I'll close some of these windows. Okay, so here we go. There's the title. There's the authors. Here's the abstract. Now this is a very detailed abstract where they're giving you a summary of all these different things. Materials, method, results. This is a great abstract. This abstract, you could really get a summary of, of everything they did in this. But so we got the abstract. Okay, introduction. Just like we've seen before. There's that that same format, introduction. Why did we want to do this? Now, in this introduction, they have some objectives in here too. You'll see different things, but it always kind of follows the same, same area. There we go, need for the study. They have that formally pulled out. That's usually in the introduction. Materials and methods, there we go. Sometimes it just says materials, sometimes it usually says methods. This one says materials and methods. How did we, how did we do this research? What's the research design? Okay, here's the results. And here's our famous tables. Usually those results, you're going to see a lot of tables of data. So I think it's kind of nice to have this format in your head and to know what you're getting into and that generally speaking, it's going to be following this format. Look at that. Surprise, surprise. Discussion. What do these results mean? And the conclusion. Okay. And then again, the references at the end. So we got that. Let's go back to our presentation here. Look at another one. And this one opened directly into the study. So I'll make this bigger so we can look at it. Okay, there's the title. Here's an abstract. Another great abstract here. Look at how broken down that is. They're giving you a summary of all the different areas. That's really nice. So definitely read that. <clears throat> look at that. Introduction. They're telling us about the basics of this thing that they're studying. Why did they think they needed to do this study? Introduction, information and methods. There's the methods section. How did we do the research? There's the methods right there. Results. Here's the results. Again, this is this one, not as intensive a results section as we've seen in some of the others, but they are, I don't see any tables here, but they are giving you the results there, the raw data. Discussion. Oh, wait, there's the table. They put the table at the bottom of the page. And the discussion. What does this mean? And you see in the discussion, it's nice. They bring it up. Pain is an unpleasant feeling and emotional experience related to tissue damage or potential tissue damage. They're telling you pain. No one likes pain. They're getting back to some common language then in the discussion, which is why I like to kind of jump to the discussion after I've read the introduction so I can keep it basic before I get into the more complex data. Big discussion, and then there's their conclusion. Let's look at one more. I find it very useful to have this just to know kind of how predictable these are. And these are all separate studies, not the same authors, not the same publications. Let's go into the full text here. Make this bigger so we can see this. Okay, here we go. Abstract. The abstract looks a little different. Again, we've, we've had good luck today. These are a lot of times the abstract will just be one paragraph, but this one, these are great abstracts. Look at that introduction, materials and methods. There we go. You start to see there's a very, very predictable format for these things. Results. What did, what did we find in here? And look at that surprise, surprise tables. Tables of data in the results, and there's the discussion. Okay, 
what the findings of this study show the effect of music therapy on the anxiety and depression of patients with cancer. Okay, see that's why I like skipping after the introduction to the discussion. I, this really helps me understand what we're talking about. And again, not everyone will recommend this. This is how I read these. So I can keep it on a basic level and really understand what we're talking about. Then I'm going to go back and look under the hood and look at the data and look at the methods. How did they gather this research? There's the conclusion. According to the findings of this study, use of music therapy is an easy, inexpensive, and safe method to reduce anxiety and depression. Okay, therefore, it is recommended to implement music therapy as a part of nursing care services. That's really telling me the gist of what they learned, of what they believe that the data shows. And I would, again, kind of skip to the end to get to this stuff before I look, really look at all the data. You can get really bogged down if you're reading through and you don't really know you don't really know this area too well and you get bogged down with all of this and you don't even know what the article is talking about so that's why I recommend that <clears throat> let's go back to our presentation here and one other very important section the references so at the end of peer-reviewed articles they're always going to have all these references for all these other studies that they referenced, that they read, that they looked at, that they based a lot of this research on. Because there's a large body of work. We talked about how this type of information is generated. And these people are familiar with this material. And they, they referenced a lot of it. They read it. They, they weren't just creating all of this from scratch. And you shouldn't be in your paper either. Let's look at some examples here. Here's a peer-reviewed article. We're going to open this up. This is probably one we looked at earlier. I'm going to make this bigger. Let's go to the end here. We're talking about references. Here's their references. Okay, look at all these things here. Now, you see this one is doing it with footnotes. And you'll <clears throat> you'll see it done different ways. Some people, if it's done in standard APA practice, usually there's Parentheses, parenthetical citations, there's parentheses at the end of a sentence. Here we go. 14. Pain itself is responsible for the immediate seeking for medical attention. That all people experience anxiety and pain is very common. Pain itself is responsible for the immediate seeking for medical attention. 14. What does that mean? I see 17 there. What does that mean? If you go to the references at the end. 14. Here we go. Middle range therapies, application to nursing research. That's where they found, that's where the articles found that information. Looking through, th all throughout this article, they're going to put little numbers to tell you. Anxiety can be aggravating when it consistently intensifies to a point of debilitating and distressing effects on one's life. Let's go to 18. So it gives us a little map. Where did that information come from? And if you're interested in this research, this is a great map for other articles that you could read on this topic if this is something you're interested in. Again, it's like looking under the hood of the car. They're letting you see backstage to see all the little, to see where they got this information from. So there's, that just shows you an example of the references. Very important. You're always going to find those in a peer-reviewed article. Let's look at a popular magazine article to see the differences. Okay, why is it hard to accept kindness? Giving is easy, but receiving is another calculus altogether. You can change that. Sounds very interesting. It's from Psychology Today. Psychology Today is a great publication, but it's not a peer-reviewed publication. Psychology Today takes peer-reviewed literature or professional literature and boils it down so the average person who's interested in psychology can read it and make sense of it. Sounds good to me. I'm not a professional in the area of psychology, but I'm interested in it. Relationships, give and take. Why is it hard to accept kindness? Look how different, after looking at all these peer-reviewed articles, look how different a popular magazine article looks. You've got pictures. The idea is that you're going to be reading this at home, reading this on the bus, reading this on a train. You're interested in it, but you, you want this to be basic. You don't see references. You don't see footnotes. You don't see materials, methods, abstract. You don't see any of those things. You see sections, but they're different sections. They're just sections that would help you understand it for reading. And you can see they're very basic. You've got these little 
points pulled out for you, it's great, but it's not a peer-reviewed article. And this, this is great. Now notice, no references at the end. This is great, but you really don't get to see where this information's, all this information is coming from. We're just trusting that this professional knows what they're talking about. And I'm sure the person does, and this is probably really well written, and there's nothing wrong with this article. But this article is written for someone who is not necessarily a professional in this field or, a, or an advanced student in this field. This is written for the average person like myself who's interested in psychology, but I don't have any professional training in it. This, this is great, but you don't want to be stuck in this world if you are studying psychology or you want to be a psychological professional because this author he doesn't just get his information from these magazines. He writes for these magazines, but he also is part of that peer reviewed community. He would understand very well and probably pulled a lot of this information from, from peer reviewed journals. You want to be in that community that you could read both and understand both. So hopefully that makes that make a, make a little more sense. Again, notice no, no references. Okay. That's a big, big difference. Okay. But it's really difficult to find peer-reviewed articles on exactly what I'm looking for. I get it. I trust what you're saying. That's great. But I have tried and I cannot find anything. Does this sound familiar? I hear this all the time from students. And I emphasize, yeah, it's, or it's, it, it is, it can be difficult. Okay. Let's talk about why that is. The general internet pretty much publishes everything. And I'm not just talking about time.com because they don't publish everything but they publish a lot of things they publish news stories every single day wikipedia is open to anyone to write anything on there your personal website or your blog you can put whatever you want there everything's on there so when you do a google search you can find pretty much anything anything you type in you're going to find some information on and that's great that's terrific peer-reviewed journals are the opposite it's very difficult to get an article published in a peer-reviewed journal. <clears throat> when we're talking about peer review, I should have covered this earlier. What that means, peers are other professionals in your professional community. Other academics, other people who study this, other people with PhDs, master's degrees. They're going to look over every article that, that is submitted to them. They're especially going to look at those methods sections and results sections. They're really going to review those to see if this study was done accurately and they reject most of what gets submitted to them. Most, a lot of peer reviewed journals only publish four issues a year. Some of them publish 12 issues a year. Most of them don't publish that often and it takes a long time to get an article approved. So long story short, the general internet, you can find anything on everything. Peer reviewed journals, you're only going to find certain subjects in there and very specific. Peer review journals are publishing articles on ideas that we don't necessarily know about yet. Here's the thing. If you're looking in, in the peer reviewed literature for current peer reviewed research, it's not going to be that great of a journal if it's just publishing everything we already know yet. We already know about this topic. The strength of these journals is they're doing original research to try to learn new things. So if you're approaching it, and I see so many students doing this, if you're approaching it just trying to look at something that's really well established and you're only looking at the last three years of research because you want it to be really current. How do you know? How do you know what, what the current ideas are? And if you're trying to force it to find articles of topics that were established in this discipline 30 years ago, that's not what they do. And it wouldn't be a very good journal if it was just publishing the same thing over and over again. That's what a textbook does. A textbook publishes every few years a new version that brings in new information but summarizes all the old. Peer-reviewed journal articles are not textbooks. So I'm just giving you some mistakes and pitfalls I see students making all the time. Hopefully this will make it a little bit easier. You shouldn't really be able to predict what would be published in peer-reviewed journals. And so many people I see doing the research are going in assuming they know what they're going to find and that's that's why it's so hard. Okay. Great. How should I conduct peer-reviewed research? Please help me. I want to do this. I need to be successful. How do I do this? Okay. I would recommend keeping it very broad, not specific. Keep your searches very broad. Let's see what's out there right now. What's being written, what's being written about right now on this topic? You don't know. You shouldn't know. 
this should be the new stuff that maybe is not in covered in your textbook yet. This hasn't made it into Wikipedia yet. This has not made it out into the common knowledge yet. Remember that structure of how knowledge originates. A lot of times this hasn't made it out into the summary articles yet, so you won't even know what's in there. People make it difficult by trying to be too specific. You go here trying to tell it exactly. You try to tell the journal what it's going to give you instead of you looking at the journal to see what's there. How do you know what's being published on right now in these journals? A lot of this I've already covered, but right, that's basically it. Even if you're a professional in this field, if it's a good journal, you shouldn't exactly be able to predict because it should be new research that they're publishing. Okay, let's look at an example of an effective search. I'm very open to what I find. I'm going to look at something with exercise and music. Opening up our discovery service here to search all of our journals. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to keep it really, really open. Exercise music. I've got my peer-reviewed, scholarly peer-reviewed indicator on, so it's only going to look for those journals. I'm going to keep this really really broad. And a really important thing, I haven't committed to my topic yet. This is the biggest mistake I see people make. They commit to this really specific topic and then they find out they can't find any research on exactly that. I'm keeping this really broad. I'm sure there's research related to exercise and music, but I don't know what it's going to be. I'm going to keep it very broad for right now and I'm going to see what's out there. There's 3,618 articles it found. There is no shortage of information on this subject. But before, before I commit to writing a paper that has to be based on articles from the last five years, let's say, let me set that here, <clears throat> 2015 to 2020, how can I really commit to knowing what's out there until I've done this research? I took it down, it's still got about 1,600 articles. And let's just look through here and see what's interesting. That sounds interesting. Does motivational music influence maximal bench press strength and strength endurance? See how specific that is? Okay, that's great though. I wouldn't have known that that was out there. I would have had no way to know that was out there. But it's out there. And I might want to set this aside in a folder to look at later. We can talk about that in a different video. Okay, there is so much interesting things. Look at that. Cerebral mechanisms underline the effects of music during a fatiguing isometric ankle dorsiflexion task. Okay, that's cool. I wouldn't have known that was out there, and it's really specific, really. But see, my paper, my paper is starting to kind of write itself now because I'm getting these ideas. This is fun. Instead of trying to force it to be what I'm saying it's about. Right here, if I want to look at an abstract, look at this. There's an abstract right there. I don't even have to go all the way into the article to get a quick summary of what this article's about. I'll throw that in the folder too. Maybe I could get more specific now. <clears throat> maybe exercise is, the sub is one of the subjects of the article and maybe music has to be in the title. Now I can start to get more specific. Okay, now we're down to 210 articles. Effective fast tempo vocal and instrumental music on cardiovascular parameters. Okay. Really get, and I can just get more. Now that I know there are things out there, maybe I could put some version of the word cardio is in there. I did cardio with an asterisk, so we get cardio, cardiovascular, any version of cardio. Do my search again. And you see what I'm doing? I'm doing this. Now we're down to 16 articles. That might be enough to write my paper on. But I, and I'm not writing my paper yet. I'm looking to see what's out there. A lot of times you'll hear this referred to as a literature review. I want to see what's out there. And my paper is starting to write itself now. And there's so many different areas I can talk about in my paper. I don't have to do this original research myself. I'm going to learn from other people who've done original research. Okay, see, that's really not that hard. And it's really cool what I'm finding. High tempo music prolongs high intensity exercise. This is going to be a cool paper. I wouldn't have known I was going to write about this, but now I see what's out there. This is being written about a lot. This is being written about a lot, and now I know where to send my paper. I was interested in music and exercise, but I kept it really open. And now I'm finding some great things. Okay, let's go back to our presentation here. 
Let's look at an example of not so effective search. I'm only looking for one exact idea. We're going to open up the same database. Okay, so this is what I see a lot. I want music, and I want exercise, and it has to be related to weights, and mood, and teenagers, and drinking. No results were found. This is what I see all the time, all the time, when people get in touch with me and say they can't find anything. You're being too specific. And there might be something out there on this, but you're, you're trying to tell the journals what's in there instead of looking to see what's in the journals. Now, we could do something similar to this. First off, it doesn't work that well to put it all in one box. Look, this happens all the time, and you're probably doing this. Some of you have made this mistake. I made this mistake when I was younger, too. Let's do this. Music, exercise, some version of teen. Teen with an asterisk, that's going to get teen or teenager or adolescent. Some version of the word adolescent, asterisk. Let's do a more basic search now. Let's do this really basic. Okay, now it's finding things. I found 276 things. And again, this is interesting, but I have to kind of go where the research leads me. I want to see what's out there. I want to learn. I don't want to try to force it to learn from me. I want to learn what's being studied. What are people studying right now? This is what people are studying. I don't have, I don't have the time. This is an eight-week class. I don't have the time to do my own original research study. I'm going to have to learn from other people what's being studied right now. And this is going to help me understand what's going on in the professional community. So there's an example of the way that you really, that it works a lot better and it's a lot more fun. It's just a struggle if you try to force it to do what you're telling it to do. Here's another thing. Don't look for the paper you're writing. I see this all the time. Someone comes up with a great topic and then they try to force the databases to only find exactly that subject. That's not what you're going to do. Look for interesting papers you can use to support various aspects of your paper or that could generate ideas for you to write about. That's what I was doing. I was doing research to generate ideas to write about. And even when I do lock on to a specific topic, I'm not just going to look for papers exactly about that. If you look at the references in these other papers, that's, every, every reference isn't about the same thing. There's all kinds of references in there that you go, you're going to weave your paper together with. I think of this as like, think of it the analogy of uh, baking some chocolate chip cookies. There's a lot of ingredients that go in there. The references for the chocolate chip cookies are flour, eggs, milk, sugar, chocolate chips, maybe some walnuts, whatever. But the recipe for a chocolate chips isn't just dumping for chocolate chip cookies isn't just dump, dumping a bunch of chocolate chip cookies in into your bowl and mixing it up. That's not how it works. There's a bunch of separate ingredients that combine to make those. And there wouldn't be any point doing it if you were just going to get get the cookies already made. Great, we don't need to bake cookies. But if you want to mix the cookies yourself and make make your own cookies, you have to use separate ingredients to mix together. Your paper is no different. You shouldn't be looking for some paper that's exactly your paper or 25 versions of exactly your paper. I see that all the time. That's, that's, not, that's, not, it. that's not what we're doing here. Your paper should be unique. The research you use is informing and supporting your paper, not duplicating it. You should have some original ideas, some original interpretations from the research you read. It shouldn't just be a carbon copy. And the idea you have for your paper Probably no one has had that exact idea, and you shouldn't be surprised when you don't find that exact paper or a bunch of versions of that paper. Again, don't look for your paper. That doesn't exist yet. That's what you're writing. Look for other papers that are related that you can learn something for, from and to generate ideas from. Review what's out there before you completely commit, commit to your topic. This is hard if you've completely committed to a very specific topic and the last thing you do is your research. Good luck with that. Good luck. That's going to be really hard. Like I said, 
if the peer reviewed journals are worth anything, you really don't know what they're publishing on. That's new information. You should review what's out there before you try to write a summary paper for what's being published on right now. You, you don't know, and it's really hard if you're completely married to a topic before you do your research that some of you know out there, some of you are hearing this saying, oh yeah, that is so hard and it certainly isn't any fun and you don't end up learning very much. Okay, in a basic student paper, don't try to change the world or revolutionize your field of study. I'm sure you have some really advanced ideas and maybe other people aren't writing about that right now. But learn from what people are writing about right now at a basic in a basic student paper. When you have a class that goes by quickly, when you get, if you continue on to get a graduate degree in this subject for your master's thesis or for your PhD or for a book you write later or for some revolutionary work you're going to do in the field, you will be expected to do original research. But if it's a basic student paper, it's just an assignment, you're not expected to change the world right now and you don't have the time to do that. And you don't have the expertise either. That's what you're learning. You're learning from these studies. You're learning how a study is done. You're learning how to gather the data. Once you get past that hurdle, yeah, you'll be unstoppable. You'll be able to publish that world-changing research, but you're not there right now, and you're going to really shortchange yourself in your education if you try to jump the gun on that. Okay, we're almost done. Did you ever think we would get to the end of this? I know I've had so many thoughts about this. I have so many thoughts on this, but let's talk about a few other things. Okay, peer-reviewed articles are very very specific in what they cover. If you haven't noticed, this is a big frustration when people jump in and want to do, notice all the research I did, I kept it general to see what's out there. Here's a search I did. This is just a general search I'm going to link into here. And it was another just general search like I do it. Uh, this is basically a shorthand telling it that in the title I want to see the word exercise and in the title I want to see depression. So all these articles should have exercise and depression in there. Looking at it, look how specific these are. The effect of Tai Chi and Qigong exercise and depression and anxiety within of individuals with substance use disorders, a systematic review and meta-analysis. That's really specific. And peer-reviewed articles generally are very, very specific. They're generally studying or reviewing one specific idea. You don't want to approach it thinking that it works like a Wikipedia page. And there is nothing wrong with Wikipedia. I love Wikipedia. I have no problem with it. But Wikipedia is very broad and is summarizing a lot of different things. And and it's probably pulling a lot from peer-reviewed articles, but it's a summary, it's a summary page pulling everything together. When you're looking at peer-reviewed articles, when you're going to the source of the information, it's generally going to be very, very specific. Physical exercise and geriatric depression and opinion. This is very specific. It's specific to the geriatric population. Bouldering psychotherapy is more effective in the treatment of depression than physical exercise alone. Results of a multi-center randomized, randomized controlled intervention study. What's bouldering psychotherapy? I don't know, but it's a very, very specific topic. That's how these studies work. Don't go in expecting to find just general overall summaries of everything because they're usually very, very specific. It's just the way that they work. Now, if you're just learning about a topic and you are required to use peer-reviewed articles, consider looking at review or systematic review articles as opposed to studies. A systematic review or review, if that's in the title, those are reviewing a lot of studies and they are creating summaries. These are great. So if you're having troubles, you need to use peer-reviewed articles and you really need to get up to speed just on what's out there, which is great. In this one, I did a search for some version of Alzheimer's or dementia has to be in the title and in quotation marks, systematic review. Okay? So all of these are going to be reviews of a lot of different studies to summarize the basics of what we know about these topics. Look at this. Look at all of these. Systematic review. And when we go in, instead of it being one, it still is generally going to be very specific. But if we go in, it's going to review a lot of studies and kind of summarize a lot of the knowledge that's out there. So 
That's one trick is put review or systematic review in the titles of the articles if you're looking for that summary type information. Okay, this was a long talk. I appreciate you listening to this. Uh, I think I've taken enough of your time. I hope this I hope this clears things up a little bit. There's my contact information. If you have any questions about this or anything else related to libraries or research or anything at all, please get in touch with me. I'll help you any way that I can. Thank you very much.